Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. This is episode number six of season nine. Today is Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. My name is Sonal Patel and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, all right, you guys, just remember to go ahead and start following and supporting this podcast on Spotify. Remember, Anchor just became Spotify for podcasters a few months ago. So I'm going to love all of your continued support to my content-rich value-add podcast on Spotify as well. And I definitely see all of you out there worldwide who are tuning in to my podcast through my Spotify analytics. So I'm so humbled that my particular podcast has so much reach, just under 60 countries. That's phenomenal phenomenal. So thanks to all of you. Now, all right, you guys, I'm going to be heading out tomorrow to glorious San Diego, California for an incredible retreat that I'm going to be speaking at hosted by Advanced Coding Services. So I'm hoping to get some really great material for upcoming podcasts while I'm out there interviewing other really well-known and fantastic leaders in this very niche world of medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance. Today's Newsworthy features another interview I was invited to with my very good friend, Betty Hovey, on her show, Healthcare Happenings, that streams live on LinkedIn as well as YouTube. Now, this entire conversation that we had is filled with trusty tips and recommendations on our third and final part of our three-part series on medical audits. In part three of this conversation, we focus on the bells and whistles of the actual audit report. And of course, I go ahead and close out this episode in Spark with a remarkable quote on success by Roy T. Bennett. If you guys have checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations to want to dive in deeper to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve your coding accuracy as you help all your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and definitely start following this podcast on Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast. I'd really love all of your continuing support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my compliance recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, and in billing for multi-specialty physicians, in compliance, and in auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. Today's episode is sponsored by Advanced Coding Services, a leading medical billing and medical coding school in the United States. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned professional, our training equips you with the tools and support you need to advance your career. Our medical billing and coding school meets your needs worldwide online or in person with one-on-one support throughout your training. We are committed to helping our alumni and credentialed medical community in keeping up their certifications by offering various avenues for acquiring your continuing education units. In addition to our Mastering the Business of Medicine retreats, Offered several times throughout the year in different parts of the country, we now offer memberships. You can conveniently earn your CEUs by attending our exclusive members-only webinars. Since our aim is to nurture and grow the careers of individuals who work in the business of medicine, we call our member area the Apple Orchard. Advanced Coding Services. Educate. Nurture. Inspire. Reaching back with a hand up. Happy. Happy Baby Friday. Uh, welcome back to a, another session of Healthcare Happenings. Um, I am Betty Hovey, and I am with my good friend and colleague, Sonal Patel of SP Collaborative. Hey, Sonal. Hey, Betty. How are you today? Hi, everybody. Good. 
Good. And we have good a lot you. of people coming in and saying hi already. So that's really good. Um, we have uh, Barb Shaw. Oh, Barb's here. Hey, Barb. Uh, and Sonia was our first one in today saying hey to us. So hey, nice. Sonia. Um, and we have Kieran um, and Marie. So we got a lot of people coming in. So good, good, good. That's wonderful. So wonderful. Uh, what we're here today to discuss is our third part in our three-part series on our auditing and the audit process. And so prior to this session, our first one was on preparing for the audit. Uh, how to pick it, what kind of audit you're going to do, all of that good stuff. And then our last session for the audits was on actually doing the audit. So we did that one in our last broadcast. And then today we wanted to wrap it up with the audit reporting and you know what comes after with all of that stuff. So that's kind of where we're going. So for those of y'all who missed either of the first two sessions, you can go to my YouTube channel and you can watch the other ones there, plus all the past healthcare happenings that are up there. Um, I, I looked at that the other day and they had some of the first ones that I did and I was like, oh Lord. <laughs> It's just you learn so much as you start doing them, you know. Um, so it was uh, very, very different when I first started doing them to how I've kind of morphed into it today. But, um, but you know, that's good. That's how it goes, right? Um, that's how we grow. Exactly. We all have to start true. somewhere. Yes. 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 Uh, and speaking of that, um, Sonal, before we get started, I wanted to remind everybody um, Sonal, oh, I don't have your Sonal. Um, if you want to find her on LinkedIn for her company, as I said, it's SP Collaborative. So here is her uh, company LinkedIn page, and I will cut and paste those into the chat so people can go check it out there. Uh, and she also, for her personal, you know, if you want to follow her personally and follow the company, you know, you can find her here for her personal page on LinkedIn. Um, and I, I, as I said last time, I think it's a good idea for those that are watching if, if they want to, you know, get different things, you know, to go ahead and follow both pages. Cause I know on my LinkedIn personal page, I post different things than my company CHCS posts. So um, if you want to kind of see everything that we're doing, um, just go to each one of them and, you know, follow on both, both sets, because uh, at least I do, I, is that, do you do the same thing, Sonal? Yeah. I learned from folks like you, right. Who've already had your own, LLCs, your own companies established, right? So I've learned from you that I absolutely do post different things on the company page versus my own personal page. So yeah, yeah. you'll always get something fresh and different on each platform. So yeah. <laughs> Sure. And I tell people, y'all will know when it's for me versus the company page, because I try to be a little more professional when it comes out from yes. the company, you know, but true, when it's true. something that I'm posting, it always says, hey, y'all, and, then, <laughs> and then right, whatever right. it is that exactly. I have to, to discuss. So that's how you kind of know exactly. the difference. So um, true. So now, true. Also, too, don't forget, Sonal can be found with her podcast, which is Paint the Medical Picture. Um, you can get it on Spotify, on Apple Podcast, like anywhere you can download Everybody. that kind of stuff. You can find her. Um, yes. So this is just the Spotify one that I put up here. But if you um, look under Paint the Medical Picture Podcast, podcast. you know, you will find, you know, a way to get to her one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I love it. And uh, we also will, Sonal and I will both be in June 9th through the 11th in San Diego at the Business of Medicine Retreat by the Sea. Boy, that's a, mm -hmm. man, that's man a mouthful. Yeah. That's a mouthful. Uh, retreat by the Sea. So uh, mm -hmm. that is going to be put on by Advanced Coding Services. And uh, both of us are really psyched about doing this. Um, it is going to be at uh, a, a university there, and we are all going to be just kind of communing together for the weekend. So we'll eat together, we'll hang out together. So if you are uh, in one of the sessions and then have a question, 
then you didn't get a chance to ask, well, when we're eating, you can, you know, sit with us, come over, ask us, continue the conversations. So it's not, you know, stuffy and you don't have to wear your business clothes and you can wear a t-shirt and, and shorts and, you know, flip flops, whatever makes you comfortable to come into the sessions, all very relaxed. And so it'll be a nice intimate setting and a good way to network with others and really get to know people, you know, um, us as speakers, you know, those of us that will be there and, and we've got a, um, Beth has put together a really good lineup, you know, Sonal is going to speak, I'm going to speak, Christine Hall is speaking, Brenda Edwards, Pam Vanderbilt, we have uh, Ruby Woodward, uh, so we have a lot of heavy hitters, so to speak, mm -hmm. in our industry that are going to be there. So I'm really, really psyched about it. So um, make sure, let me see if that's still, no, it doesn't. Make sure that you go check it out um, at advancedcodingservices.com. I'm trying to get my thing to look. There we go. So um, these are some of the sessions on HIPAA. Uh, both Sonal and I are going to be doing some e &M stuff. I'll let you, mm -hmm. Sonal, tell you about what she's going to do with it. But mine is going to be more of a hands-on coding sessions that we're going to do. Uh, I've developed a game for e &M, And so we're going to play my coding game. So that'll be kind of fun to kind of get us all um prepped and, and make sure we're on the right track with our E&M. Um, Sonal, your session, uh, you've got two sessions, but your E&M session, you're going to hit what? The new auditing standards of 2023 and beyond, right? Um, really interesting slant to take because we've all been just, you know, drowning in our 1995 and 1997 way of doing things, right? That approach is very, very different than what we should be doing today and beyond. So that's the approach. And I know your hands-on stuff, actually looking at a few samples is going to be really helpful for all of us to take a look with a new lens. So it's good. Yeah. I can't wait Everything to play the game. Together. Together. I love playing that game. So yeah, um, that'll be fun, fun too. It's going to so, be fun. Yeah. Um, and then at, we'll remind everybody before we sign off about it again, too. Um, yeah. But we've got two weeks. So if you are it's thinking about corner. attending, um, you know, make sure you yeah. go to uh, Beth's website at advanced, oops, at advanced coding services dot com and take a look at what's on there. I will cut and paste this into the chat also so people can go mm -hmm. take a look at it. Um, and I think, I don't know if Lady, I haven't seen a, a hey from Lady yet. She might be coming back from the AAPC conference though. So um, that may be why, because usually she is one of the first people in to start chatting with us and they haven't seen so her true. in there today. So, yeah. uh, and I think uh, many people that went to HealthCon are probably making their way back today. So exactly. um, yeah. Uh, they can catch it on the uh, replays on mm -hmm. YouTube, as I said before. So what we're going to talk about today, as, as we said at the beginning, is the um, reporting for our audits. So um, there's different ways and different kinds of reports you can put together. And we kind of talked a little bit about it last time um, about using audit software. You know, so are you going to use audit software um, what do you use it for? You know, those kinds of things. Um, oh, Brabiella said she's still enjoying Nashville. So yeah, she, oh, she must've nice. stayed over a little bit. So that's good. Oh, that's great. So, that's great. um, as far as the, um, uh, the software goes er, for people that are listening in today, if you do use auditing software, please, go ahead in the chat and type in and tell us what software y'all use. Yeah, and, nice. um, you know, if you like it or not, what do you like about it? So that others that are on the line on the session, if they're thinking about getting some, they kind of have an idea maybe of what to look at. Um, I, I think with some of the audit software, there's pros and cons, you know, to using it. Uh, I think the pro is that obviously for using software, you 
probably can get into a, a little bit of a faster groove and and have everything kind of look clean. Uh, but to me, a big con to that is a lot of times, just like with um, uh, E&M notes, right? You have the template. So Mm -hmm. you end up seeing to where everything starts looking the same. And so then you get this report and it just looks like it's the same thing said over and over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And and who wants to read that? You know, um, you you get, I think some people can put too many of those canned statements in there. And um, I remember I was using one once uh, and every audit report would end up being like 50 pages long because mm-hmm. right. of all those canned statements and it would That's give right. one for each provide. And so it would be one page sometimes would take it up with just one note because of those mm-hmm. canned statements that would come out. And then it was the same ones over and over and over. So not only was it huge, it was also just repetitive. Mm-hmm. And I was like, who wants to read that? You know? Uh, and so people were just reading the executive report. Yeah, nobody was reading all that detail. So you spend all that time in doing this and make it all nice and pretty. And then nobody looks at it because it's just too much. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we touched on this before, right? That you and I like to individualize our reports, which is why I myself personally haven't really um, utilized a audit software in the work that I've performed before, because you're right. When I've looked at previous consultants or companies, wherever these audit reports come from, they can be massive for exactly those reasons. They are simply um, templates that are copied and pasted again and again and again, right? Um, You can exchange the product and the provider wouldn't even know. You know what I mean? Because it's literally the same thing that you've done for the other guy, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big drawback to that type of reporting. We really want to make sure when we conclude the audit that we draft original, right, thoughts and recommendations, not only in our executive summaries, but throughout the report, right, specific to an individual date of service, for example, that really stands out with a finding, right? You really want to tweak your language individually for each and every provider, for each and every date of service, um, because you also really want to make this, um, you know, uh, uh, cost savings as well for the provider or the hospital system or whoever that you are auditing for, right? We, we really have to take into account the budget for the potential client as well and work together. So that can't really be addressed or relieved if we're simply using that software to, you know, perpetuate the same data again and again and again and again. It has to be individualized. If we're trying to teach our providers to individualize those patient encounters, <laughs> good point, we yeah. should be doing, we should be doing the same thing, right? Yep. Yep. So yeah. And, and it doesn't do any good. You, if they won't read it, they're not going to get any education. So, I mean, if no. it just looks like it's the same thing, they're just yes. going to go, yeah, whatever. 50, and 50 pages, they will not read 50 pages. They, we want them to read their 50 pages in a JAMA article in the weekend, you know, yeah, as yeah. their relaxation time. We don't want them to be reading our reports of 50 pages. They're going to throw that out. It's not effective. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so as far as software goes, and now, you know, this, of course, is not an all inclusive list of some, but some Sonal and I were doing a little research. And um, Healthicity is one that is uh, put out by AAPC. Uh, there also is Gebs. Gebs Healthcare has an audit tool. Um, most of these two now are uh, 
cloud or downloaded software that you you know would have living on your laptop uh, some of them are cloud-based so they all have different kind of things to them um, that people like don't like that kind of thing so um, I would say if you're in the market for auditing software you you know just check out everything that you can some of them have mm -hmm. free trials some of them do not um, price ranges uh, I've seen have been all over all the over. place all over the um, place. Yeah. We have some that are like, you have to buy a year license, some you can pay monthly, some are like in the $80 a month range and up to like, we've seen some that have been, you know, a couple hundred a month couple range. Hundred. So, I mean, it just, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, widely varied. Yeah. So look at yeah. your budget, look at what the things offer, what you need it to do you know uh and then if they have a trial you know do the free trial Take it. Uh, yeah. if they do demos you know you might want to get a demo and kind of watch and see what it does uh, ask a lot of questions because yeah. just like with an ehr in my opinion once you decide on one and you get into it if it's not working for you it's going to be kind of hard you know, to change over and to get a different software in. And then, you know, it's just like changing EHR software. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. So really kind of take a look before you, you pull the trigger, I would say. Um, okay. And you've got to do your research. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, MD audit, IntelliCode. Mm -hmm. There's also a Swift audit that was designed by, um, uh, Bar it's Barbara Sh Moy. Shirley, Shirley Moy. Sh yeah. Shirley Moy. Shirley um, so Moy. Swift Audit is another one. Um, and you want to check out because some of them are exclusive to E&M uh, mm -hmm. and some of them have E&M and also surgical that you can do in there too. So you want right. to take right. a look at that issue also. Now we right. have a um, somebody who's made a comment. Uh, and again, it's because it's the LinkedIn user. I have no idea who this is. So and they it's not me this time. <laughs> Usually because I'm like, talking. Hey, that's yes. Sonal. Uh, so it says they've developed mm -hmm. their own audit software tool developed oh, by their coders. So that's cool. Oh, wow. Fully cool. customizable, transparent. Cool. They currently only grant access to their clients and for internal audits, but maybe okay. there's a way to offer right. it to a broader market. So um, awesome. true. You know, so yeah, if okay. who, uh, if you want to put in the chat, you know, go ahead and enter in your contact information so that if people want to kind of reach out um, to you and ask you questions about the, the audit software, right. but that's that's a nice uh, offer there. So mm -hmm. um, and by the way, lady did chime in. So she's she uh, said, hey, oh, from she's Nashville. Here? So, okay. yes. So she Good is she's here. here. Awesome. Hey, lady. <laughs> so, hey, lady. And uh, Kimberly, Joe Lavette Williams is also here. So um, we're getting kind of the old gang running in here. So nobody's nice. mentioned any software that they're using other than my LinkedIn user. Uh, so I, I don't know that anybody else has comments. So we will right. move into our other areas. If you do, just throw them in the chat and other people can, you know, take a look at them as they're, as they're listening to us too. Um, so now... Whether you use software, or don't use software, you know, I think there are um, specific things that you always want to get in your audit reports. Uh, and as I said, uh, mentioned, you know, the executive report, you know, I always found um, that from of upper administrative part, you know, when you have your detail where you're going through your comments about, you know, you didn't have this piece or you should have documented this better. An executive doesn't want to read all that stuff. You know, they don't want to get in the weeds. They just want the down and dirty. You know, how did they do? What do we need to work on? Is there an issue? You know, so I always include an executive summary that will say, you know, this many physicians and APPs were audited, this many records were audited, um, you know, here's their percentage, you know, of uh, how they did. And, and depending on what you're looking at, is it just the CPT? Is it also including the ICD-10? So, you know, you also have to get that kind of settled out with your client or internally, if you're doing it, you know, with your practice at, at what exactly they want to keep figures on. Um, because I've been at some practices that really could care less about the ICD-10s. They just wanted to know that they were documenting properly for the CPT. So I'm okay. 
fine. You know, um, and I've had others where, you know, they want us to look at everything. So, you know, um, you'll have to kind of decide on how you're figuring your percentages. But, you know, you also give that out in um, findings and recommendations. So those are the things that I usually include in an executive summary. Um, what what do you usually put in your Sonal? Those are exactly the points that I touch on. Um, and you especially want to address if you happen to be working for an attorney as well, right? We really need to be specific on the methodology that we're using um, um, yep. how, how we helped the practice choose these particular charts that we want to look at, these particular claims, these dates of service, the modifiers, if we're honing in on something specifically, um, we really want to try and include that as well in an executive summary also. Um, but the most important things are, right, we have to be transparent and communicate with our client, right? What is their end goal, right? Why did they come to you? So make sure that that's also spotlighted in your executive portion. Um, and again, even if you're using that audit software, which I'm sure they're all amazing, we need to make sure that we're individualizing it, right? So yes, it might populate some things that are templated, but you can also tweak it when you receive it, right? That's kind of um, my biggest takeaway when you're trying to save time, trying to be efficient by using a template, you can definitely um, address the fact of individualizing it for each and every provider. So um, yeah, we really want to see that in the executive summaries for all of the audits that we're performing for all of our clients throughout the year, right? And so absolutely true. Your percentages will change based on what, you know, columns of data we are addressing. If it's going to be those CPT codes and HCPCS codes, the modifiers or not, the diagnoses or not, right? And then all of those comments. And then what about our payers, right? That's also a big thing that I think I touched on at the last conversation. Yep. Um, we really need to make sure we address the payer um, in the entire audit process because many of our providers are not going to have just an audit on patients for the Medicare population, right? They're also seeing people who have Anthem or Cigna or Aetna. So we really have to be specific on looking at those reimbursement policies at what, as, as well that will affect the audit process um, and all of our findings. So I think that's really important to include in the audit report. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the methodology is something that I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking about that, that is very, very important. I, I usually, at the beginning of my executive summaries, I put that, you know, CHCS was employed mm -hmm. by or was engaged by whatever the practice was to perform mm -hmm. audits and right. done using rat stats. And, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I do make sure you kind of step by step through um, right. to, to show that it was truly randomized or if mm -hmm. it's targeted for some reason, targeted. like you're looking yeah. at consults, you know, mm -hmm. when we used to be able to bill them to everybody, that yeah. was a common thing that I would do audits on because right. everybody was worried about that because nobody was doing it right, <laughs> which is <laughs> why we ended up not being able to do them anymore. But I, I did quite a few uh, uh, specific targeted audits on just consults. Um, so, you know, you would kind of state that at the beginning of, of mm -hmm. what you're looking for. Um, but uh, so I, I will do an executive summary. Usually it's a page, maybe two, mm -hmm. depending on how mm -hmm. much in how many, like how many physicians and APPs yeah. are being audited. Like some, so right. sometimes they can get a little long, but somewhere mm -hmm. between one and two pages is really, I've never had one that's gone further than that personally. Um, and then you get into the detail. Now, when I do the detailed ones and um, as we were a, last time talking about um, you and I both are, are old school and I'm back to using my Excel spreadsheets, you know, so yes. I make the Excel, 
Excel spreadsheet for it, which contains the patient's medical record number. I don't use patient names on mine um, just, you know, to, for safety reasons, because you never know who could be looking at it, get their hands on that kind of thing. Yes. So I use medical yes. record numbers, um, data service, uh, who the provider, what, what the physician or APP's name was, uh, and then what the CPT codes were that they assigned what the ICD-10 codes were that they assigned if we're looking at ICD-10 and mm -hmm. then what was audited. So what the recommended codes are um, both in CPT and ICD-10 if we're doing both. Mm -hmm. And um, then I have also a column where I put comments. So if there's something specific and the payor, you know, another column for the payor um, that if there's something specific in there, like uh, they built this uh, reported, they wanted to report level four, but with the um, MDM, the data elements only raised to low and this element only, you know, to where I can be a little bit more explanatory in the comments right. section so that right. when the person that was audited was reading through their report, it wouldn't just be, it's wrong. Or it's okay. I fine. Right. You know, I'm. Right. There has to be something, at least in my opinion, in there. Uh, especially if you're looking at payors for things like mm -hmm. Medicare mm -hmm. doesn't allow this. So mm -hmm. that's why this, you know, this one code because it bundles under NCCI, so you can't do it. You know, anything like that. Um, I like to always put that extra information in there. Um, and then when I cut move it over onto the reports every provider that was audited will have their own section and mm -hmm. then, you know, go section by section so that if they want to, the practice wants to give the individual their own audit results, they can do it without them being able to see everybody's and how everybody right. did. Cause people get a little funky about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly and Kimberly both just for our, the Excel spreadsheets, Kimberly, and then oh, I love uh, it. Shelly said me too, <laughs> but I'm old. So, <laughs> so yeah, it, it just, um, I like the audit software for the reporting capabilities. That was something we were talking about. So um, just to kind of, you know, th throw back on that for a second from the Excel spreadsheet issue. Um, uh, but the reporting that you can do from some of these softwares is very good because you can do tracking, you know, like how they've yes. done on the past three audits you've done, you know, so they can kind of house that information and put it out in ways that I think could be very helpful. So I like that part of the auditing software. Yes. More than I like the auditing software specific to each and every provider kind right. of thing. So. Right. Totally then, agreed. Oh, lady loves Excel too. So good. Uh, we're, I, I was thinking okay. we're dinosaurs on this. So we're not this. alone. Okay, good. <laughs> good. good. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then once you put that all together and you deliver it, what someone with your, with your clients, what kind of is your next step after you deliver the audit report um, uh, with everything in there? Okay. And I just wanted to step back. I also must include resources in the audit report, right? Like yes, it's fine to include perhaps a link or something in the comments column of your Excel spreadsheet, just so you remember that you need to, you know, translate that again into your report and make sure that you have that citation and you really want to provide your physicians with every resource possible that you um, used in your report to help support your findings, your recommendations, et cetera. So um, that's a really key piece that you need to include as well. And of course, with the current state of the audits that my friend Betty and I are doing right now, um, you know, a lot of those links are about evaluation and management for 21 and 23, right? So make sure you look in the weeds of all of the commercial payer policies, right? Because they all have their own policies on ENM coding for right now. Um, so they all have links. They all have links to certain PDF 
you know, files that they have for what they support in today's standards. Um, so I normally give my providers, you know, a week if they need to take the time to really read, digest, come up with questions for when I will then request a circle back time, right, where I want to talk to them face to face whether it's in person, at the hospital, at their office, or if it's on Zoom. Um, you know, we really need to have a open, transparent conversation, communication about our findings. And it can literally be, uh, you know, line by line, patient by patient encounter, um, whatever they need um, is, I, I believe, as the auditor, what we need to deliver, right? It's whatever they need. If they need to really understand the guidelines that were implemented in 21, right? That was still two years ago. But I know you and I are still seeing the education that really wasn't received or yeah. they didn't take it up. They didn't have time to do it. They thought they could wing it. I really don't know. But I do know for a fact that we are still seeing um, a lot of issues in documentation standards um, that aren't being met yet. So, yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. key that we take the time, whatever time they need to, you know, help them understand the education that we've provided. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think from, uh, I still think that when we first took the leap to the 2021 new standards, uh, that a lot of places I heard over and over and over again that, oh, you know, it's not going to be a big deal. It's oh, it's going to be so deal. easy. It's going to oh, be a lot yeah, easier yeah. now. We don't have to hardly put anything in there. And, you know, um, once people started looking at the notes and it, um, it wasn't, it's not as straightforward as people think, um, especially in the data column. I also, uh, I actually have heard from some consultants, um, um, I'm not naming names that have said that they, when they train providers and educate providers, they tell them, ignore the data column because no. you only need two of three, just don't even use it. Just look, concentrate oh. on the problems addressed and the risk. And I'm like, well, um, mm -hmm. oh, 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 that's one way to go, I guess. But if you're in a specialty that does a lot of data, you data. know, you could yeah. be doing a, a huge disservice by telling, just ignore right. it because you don't understand it or because it's kind of convoluted. Well, yes, but you have to understand it because that's what's going to support the services you're doing orthopedics, exactly. you know, as we have, you know, are involved in right now, Yes, you know, there's a lot uh, in that data element, you know, mm -hmm. cardiology, there's a lot mm -hmm. in the data elements. There's certain mm -hmm. specialties that really now get better credit than they yeah. used to under the old guidelines, because before it was, I don't care how many labs or how many x-rays or how many, whatever you get one point for you get one. the 70,000, one for the 80,000, you know, and you were yeah. done. And so right. it, it was kind of like, man, this is kind of, you know, back then I would say the data was more useless, but today, because it's each unique source, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that for those specialties that are heavy in data, it really helps them. Right. So, exactly. um, exactly. you know, but that needs some education, you know, yes. and that needs some, uh, and there's still a lot of people in the old mindset. Mm -hmm. So where they just put labs Okay. Yeah. How many? What were they? You know, so right. Doing right. doing the audit brings all of those things out to where you can do mm -hmm. the important piece, which is education. Right. You know, um, and, and I really think um when you do audits, there's to me the audit is like a means to an end. The audit isn't like the be all end all thing. It it, it I don't concentrate so much as on the audit as I concentrate on the education that I give off of the audit. I look yeah. as a, at the audit as more of an educational pointer for me mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. I do as anything else, you know? Um, and, and that's why, you know, when we do our audits, you know, um, so and I both, you know, we, as she was saying, we have to round back, let them digest it first, of course, but then you want to make sure you round back with them and have those discussions. Because if you don't, 
one, as we were saying, if they're getting this long thing, or even if it's more compact and individualized, if it's 15, 20 records and it doesn't like look like it's going so hot for them, you know, right. I, I've had physicians where I've gone back and had the meeting with them and mm-hmm. they've admitted to me that they never, they read the first couple, but because there were some errors in there, they didn't want to read anymore. So they just That's stopped right. looking at it, you know, right. so um, you have to make sure, you know, because then again, it's not doing them any service. You're not doing, mm-hmm. you're not helping them, you know, mm-hmm. so go back and with me, I also use it for, uh, it could be used for group education, right? We could take Mm -hmm. the aggregate of everybody's things, look through the audit and see, are there common errors that everybody seems to be making Mm -hmm. uh, and build an education that could be given to everybody at once. Like Mm -hmm. here are the main things and the main issues that we saw when we did this audit. So be mindful of documenting this and looking here, whatever the thing is um, and not, you know, calling anybody out you know, that never works well. Um, And then you can also do the individualized. You know, I always make sure because I've had physicians and APPs tell me things when we've been doing our educational things off of the audits that they would never say in a group setting. Mm -hmm. And then I always do that one-on-one time with them to where I can go through. And like you said, sometimes it's case by case by case, you are going through Mm -hmm. each and every note to -hmm. point those things out to them. But that's for the physician and APP. That's where the gold is. It's not in that actual report. It's in that discussion that Mm -hmm. you have with them where you're giving them one-on-one education, right? Exactly. That's exactly it. I just talked to a doctor last week on a report. And he came back with so many, you know, questions on the findings. And that's the brilliant part is that conversation that you get to have, right? And try and help them understand, okay, when you're talking, I understand what's going on with the patient, right? I understand what you're trying to diagnose. I understand what you're trying to do in the plan and the assessment and the med management. But if it's not documented, right? The documentation doesn't say any of that beautiful stuff that he just told me in our conversation, right? So I I try to make them understand that all of that beautiful stuff that's up in their head has to be put out onto their documentation. Um, And I think because you and I have so much experience with actually talking to them one-on-one for such a long period of time, that's where we see the real benefits, right? Then they understand their light bulb turns on like, oh my God, you're right. I didn't write that down in the documentation. I said it just now very well about that patient in that encounter and what's going on, but it's not in black and white. It's not written down. So I think it is that, you know, verbal communication of the education that has to happen. And it has to be that two-way dialogue so we can help them understand, right, what the payer wants to see in documentation for them to receive that appropriate reimbursement. I think that's the biggest key. Um, Yeah, so you were talking about the MDM stuff. And yeah, we shouldn't really advise them to drop one of the columns in their practice simply because they only need two out of three of the columns to meet MDM, right? For the new standards. I don't think that's good advice or a good recommendation for any practice, whether it's general, peds, internal med, derm, whoever. I don't think that's a good idea um, because they need to understand that that entire table of risk, right, is pretty much similar to what they learned before in 95 and 97, right? It's just kind of reorganized, revamped, redefined. Um, All of that type of education 
needs to continue happening. I don't think we're done yet. I don't even think we've begun for 2023 standards, right? For the inpatient space, yeah. et cetera. We just started. We have a long way to go. Um, but as we said, our thread throughout today's conversation is we still see glaring issues in the outpatient and office space, right? Which we've already had since 21. Um, so it's two years later and we still see issues. So I know we have a long way to go. And thankfully we have some grace time, fingers crossed, some grace time for the payer audits that we know will be coming out for these new ENM standards, both the 21 and the 23. Hopefully a little bit more grace time because those payer audits that we're still seeing today, you and I, at least, are still seeing the old stuff, right? The old 1995, 1997 guidelines that are still under scrutiny um, with so many payers. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm currently um, uh, working with a client that has got a, um, she's got an, an insurance, a payor that's coming back after her. And the the dates of service are as far back as 2017. So as I'm looking at those records, you know, you have to use the 95 or 97 because, you know, yep. we didn't have the new ones at that point. So um, when you're auditing, that's something else you got to make sure, you know, you're keeping in the front of your mind at which set of standards am I using here? Because you may have an audit depending on what's going on now that we're getting a couple of years into the mm -hmm. new stuff mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. may have some that have the 2021 guidelines and some that have the 95 and 97 all in the same right. audit. Yes. You know? That's so, a great point. Because That's payers a great point. go, you know, payers yeah. go back. They don't just go like right yeah. now. They, they'll look five years back as they're looking at stuff, trying to, yeah. you know, get as yeah. much as they can back from you. So um, it's important to keep up and keep mm -hmm. your kind of skill up with the 95, 97 stuff, because yes. we won't be done with that for a while. They're going to keep right. going back and looking at that older stuff as long as they can. Um and if you're look, if they're looking at your 21, 23 stuff and you're not really doing great with that, you know, you probably really weren't doing great under the 95 <laughs> and 97 guidelines, right? <laughs> so, um, so um, uh, it, it's something to watch out for. And too, on the surgical side, that's something too, when you're going over those, I find when I do surgical audits, mm -hmm. that is much more involved on the one-on-one uh, -on -one education with the physician, uh, the surgeon, that. because at that mm -hmm. point, um, it's really more tied to the, the documentation elements of, you know, to making sure that um, everything is there to support that CPT code that's being done. It's not mm -hmm. as subjective as, as kind of the e &M stuff is at, at that point. Um, and, and there usually is a pattern that I find with surgeons that they kind of stick in, you know, mm -hmm. they can dictate their operative report without even looking at the patient's chart and have half of it done already because they say the same thing on every right. patient, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you can find little things there that they haven't documented, right. You know, you can kind of do that correction. But I find when I do the surgical stuff, it's much more routed to the actual operative report itself and, you know, highlighting mm -hmm. out areas and saying, you know, this portion wasn't documented correctly or, or in depth enough to support what you did or the right. approach, excuse me, got to plug my laptop in or the approach, you know, wasn't um, stated in here to match up with what the thing mm -hmm. was that this is mm -hmm. an endoscopic procedure, but you know, it looks like you did um, uh, an open procedure open. or vice versa, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, you know, so there's just different aspects depending on what kind of audit you're doing on what kinds of services. But I think the education directed one on one is where they get the most, you know, the best stuff. And and on the ENM side, I have heard just very interesting things when I ask physicians and APPs, like, how did you get to this code? You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a um, one physician one time, and there was a newer physician. 
and they wanted me to audit her because they said, okay, well, she's been here, you know, like three months now. We want to kind of see how she's doing. We want you to do just a little audit on it. So I did an audit and um, it was just all, it was bizarre. It was all <laughs> over the place. I mean, she had sometimes, she had things at fives like billing level fives for that I looked and I'm oh. like, it, 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 oh I, if I stretch it, it's a two. And she had other times when mm. she was reporting level twos when they should have been fours. I'm like, okay, she really is not getting this something, right. you know, cause sometimes mm. she's, it's not like a, the one coder, you know, how we would get right. those. Everything's oh, a yes. three kind of, everything's a three. all yeah. over the place. Mm. And so when I sat down with her to do her education, I asked her, I said, what do you think goes in? How do you come up with your e &M levels? You know, what's your thought process when you're doing it? I think that's an important question to ask when you sit down and do their education. Sure. Always ask them where the thought comes from because you can't help them and you can't correct a bad thought, mm -hmm. you know, um, unless you know what they're thinking. You know, you're just mm -hmm. kind of stabbing mm -hmm. in the dark. And so mm -hmm. she said, well, when I first got here, they teamed me up with the seasoned doctor. And they told me that he was going to tell me how to do that e &M stuff. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, okay. And she said, so when I started working with him, he told me, don't always use the same code. That's bad. And that was about all he explained to, <laughs> to her. Oh, wow. So okay. since she had that advice, what she would do was the first patient she saw was a level one. <laughs> if it's a new patient, it was a 99201. If it was established, it was 99211. Oh, my. Was wow. a two. The next patient wow. was a three. So she went one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And that's how she leveled her services out. She said, I, I, so I didn't always use the same one. He said, told me not to do that. So I would just round through the numbers and I just keep going all day long. So I'm like, oh, now, now that makes sense. You know, so we had some discussion on things and, you know, she greatly improved over her leveling and got to where it wasn't Good. such Good. a concern, you know, right. but uh, right. until you ask, until you do that education, you have no clue. And, yeah. and sometimes they have gotten little to no education. Sometimes they have gotten a lot and they ignore it. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you, you just never know until you sit down and start talking with them. And that's where the resources, like you were saying, come in. Um, another just quick little, I had one physician that would argue with me about things. And so I would always, when I would send him things, I would send him 10 resources, you know, about every, you know, yeah. look in here and look in here. And I would put them all out and I would send them to him with copies of like mm -hmm. whatever the chapter out of the CMS made. Mm -hmm. So he would get this stack back from me every right. time right. he would challenge right. me on something. And I wasn't being malicious. I wanted him to see that, mm -hmm. no, here is why you can't do this. You know, you have to get mm -hmm. that out of your mind. And after I did that about four or five times, he called me once and said, well, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think that this is right. I think that I should be able to do whatever, whatever. And I said, well, here's why you can't do that that way. And I gave him some resources and I said, and if you'd like, I could, Oh no, no, no. He's that's okay. If you said it, I'll just do it. Okay. I, I, I that's okay. I, I won't do it anymore. <laughs> so after, after that, you know, because he trusted what I said and he saw that I wasn't always mm -hmm. just cause I said so, or just, it was a flippant, Oh yeah, sure. Right. You can do that right. or, you know, kind of thing. So, um, but I find that really helps. Uh, mm -hmm. when you're educating too, is, is heavily rely on those resources, but also understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And that's what helps them the best. Do you have any certain tips that you, you know, uh, can give that you use maybe when you're doing the education with the physicians that kind of help them accept and, and get what you're saying? Well, I, th I think my biggest, um, philosophy that's always worked really well is always including in education all the things that they've done right in their documentation because normally there's so much good that our providers APPs everybody our surgeons everybody gets right right so I really want to 
probably start off conversations with all of the great stuff that that I see, right? Um, and then go in with some of those small dings that can receive some massaging, right, for improvement to be made, um, right? Because I'm not the payer, right? I'm always trying to find a way to showcase where they can make improvements, right? Because I think I can say this in almost 100% of the things that I've audited over all my years, the medical necessity is there. You know, everything is there. The patient was there. The patient was seen during that block of time, right? So all of those types of things, I know we, we didn't touch on that, but when, when you're going into the audit, you should always try and make sure if you have access to their EMR or to their scheduling or something like that to make sure that you have access to that, that laundry list of their patients that are coming in for that day, right? June 2nd, how many patients are being seen on that day? If there's 40, right, that's great. But then when you're auditing, you want to make sure that it's those 40, what were the time blocks, all of those things, right? Um, so yeah, I think I can say pretty confidently that in my time, I've only seen evidence of the medical necessity in the documentation, right? It's just these little lingering pieces that require the improvement, right? And it requires the improvement, again, for the payer um, so that reimbursement can be appropriately made because what Betty and I always strive to do is to protect the providers, right? We don't want to see the audits because you will be audited at some point in your career. It's just yep. going to happen. Um, we want to protect you from having to pay back, right? So much grotesque monies because of these small errors that the payer identifies, but then they can balloon up into a huge amount, right? Based on extrapolation and all of that nonsense that the payers have a right to do. So I think that's predominantly what our goal in education is with all of our reports is to, you know, prevent the greater mayhem that may arise from that inevitable audit that you will receive in your career from some payer or the other. Yeah. And, and, and um, I find the, the going back to what you said about, you know, doing that positive, um, my, my mama always used to tell me, you know, um, if you want to get somebody to do something or that, you know, don't go in and tell them what they're doing wrong. You know, you want to start out with, you know, overall, it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now, over yes. here, you could work on this just a little bit and then go back to the positive again. But again, <laughs> everything looked pretty good. And yep. I, 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 I always do that. I, I've always done that from taking this advice from her when I was, she always used to say that girl. So I always go in there and, and always point out, you know, what was good about it. And then we hit, and I call them tweaks. We just need to yeah, tweak tweaks. a few things. Exactly. Exactly. You know, um, uh, because usually after going through med school and going through your residence, all that kind of stuff, they, they know, they know documentation mm -hmm. basics. It's not like you're going to see they something do. where there's absolutely right. nothing in the documentation. Um, right. I mean, I've seen some really poorly documented things, but I mean, there, you know, there is documentation there. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I find that, you know, if I kind of approach it that way, then they're not defensive because right. once they feel like you're challenging them, then it can get into that. Well, you're not a doctor. And, and, you know, I said that, and yeah. then that starts to come and then you're going right. to get nowhere. You know, right. once they get defensive, you're done. They, they don't right. want to hear you. They're not going to exactly. hear you. Um, exactly. I've had, I've gotten into some pretty heated discussions, you know, um, and, and sometimes, you know, depending on the situation you're walking into, it, mm -hmm. it can be pretty stressful for both, oh, for sure. you know, for them, for sure. you know, mm -hmm. um, maybe they're, they're getting uh, audited from one of the payers or multiple mm -hmm. payers. And so they're trying to take a look at this. And then now you're going to tell them, I'm sorry, but the payor mm -hmm. was right you know, your documentation doesn't support what you did. Mm -hmm. 
and you're trying to explain that to them. And all they're saying is that you're saying that I'm wrong and they've said I'm wrong. And now this is all. And then, you know, the explosion yeah. happens, um, yeah. which is why I always tell new auditors, you know, just always try to remember mm -hmm. that they're not mad at you. Yeah, you know, right. when you get into those exactly. situations, they're mad at what's happening or they're mm -hmm. frustrated, you right. know, but they're not mad at you personally. So try right. not to take those tense exchanges personally and don't okay. get defensive back and don't get kind of snippy right. back. That's not going right. to get you anywhere. You know, you, you have to kind of learn, you know, to do that smoothly and to say yeah. even, you know, well, maybe we can come back to this at a later date, readdress it. I mean, I'm not saying sit there and take abuse from anybody, but, right. you know, um, just try to recognize what's going on and that, you know, they're, they're not really bad at you. It's not a personal issue. So try not to take that kind of stuff personally. And, and I, when I was first in consulting, I remember it was, it was kind of difficult for me. Sometimes I would be like, I'd go back to my office and be like, Oh, it was so mean to me. You know? <laughs> Uh, and those things, you know, they're, they're going to happen, but then you get used to, you know, it's kind of like you, you, you understand better. And, exactly. and so um, just don't, yeah, don't take it personally. Um, exactly. uh, and we have, I wanted That's to hear advice. a couple, Angela, Hey, Angela, she says, we are already dealing with you pick audits for 2021 claims. Oh, are you? Yep. Oh, wow. So what we okay. are saying isn't promising or reassuring that they know. Well, they yeah, it's the you pick. Yeah. It's the you pick. So yeah. yeah, that's not a good thing. The you pick is not someone you want to see come into no. your practice. No. Oh, no. Sorry, no. Angela. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Bikes. Yes, definitely. So that, that, uh, you know, they're, they're starting, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. now, cause it's been, it's usually after about a year and it's been two years now. So, yeah. um, so then next year they're going to start into where they're going to be starting to take a peek at everything else that got changed mm -hmm. this year too. Mm -hmm. And there's some changes for next year that, um, yes, they were coming. just on the, the AMA call on E&M mm -hmm. and, um, they just had an hour long session at uh, noon, my time today, uh, where they were going over some of the e &M stuff and also talking about some of the changes that we're going to see next year for e &M. They're just tweaks. You know, Small. nothing like yeah. huge like we've had, but a couple things where they're trying to make everything kind of match up and things like that um, and try to give us some more information kind of watch for as they uh, put out more information as we get further into the year that right. there'll be some minor changes in uh, the e &M section next year. Um do we have, oh, and we, I just want to put this out there uh, and I hope I, oh, I, I, I yeah. would not even want to no. try. I, I would badly butcher your name, sir, but, <laughs> but uh, we have somebody from Nigeria on. So I just wanted oh, to nice. kind of pull that up. I thought that was interesting. So thank you for joining thank us. You. Um, and uh, one other thing too, before, cause we're getting at the top uh, again, uh, Sonal, we're at the top how of our hour we, already. How are we? I don't even think we're done talking yet. Oh my God, we just got like warmed up. <laughs> but I, I wanted to put this up for y'all. Um, Cigna, you know, for everybody, it was all up in arms about the modifier 25 thing with all that faxing nonsense. They, it was supposed to start today and yesterday they let out that, you know, they're not going to do it right now. Now no. they didn't say that they totally, you know, realized that, it was silly. They're saying that it is um, um, on hold indefinitely or something like that. That they're going to keep evaluating it. They're going to keep but, evaluating it. Yep. But um, yep. they're not doing it. That's the big thing. So uh, I will put this in the chat in case anybody wants to go and actually print out or look at the actual thing. What it is, it's just a modifier 25 policy that they had made saying they were going to make us do all that. But at the top of it in red, they have a thing that says we've decided to halt it for now. So um, no faxing, no, none of that silliness on modifier 25 from Cigna now. So they um, finally decided to, to pull back. They, they waited till the 11th hour, but at least they, okay. they decided not to do it, which I'm so super glad about. Um, that, that would not have been fun for anybody. And even them, for them, it would have been burden. a nightmare. The um, huge burden yeah. for providers and for Cigna. It was a ridiculous idea. 
which they yeah. came up with and it was supposed to take effect last August. Yes. But it didn't take effect then either. So they're just going to keep doing this every year. They're just going to keep um, trying to implement this new policy mm-hmm. um, to submit your yeah. records with a minor procedure with your modifier 25. And then they'll realize that it's a huge burden. And this, again, because they come out with this policy, our doctors, physician groups, the medical societies will have to, again, band together, write another letter. So again, all of that is still more work. So this is all, in my opinion, what Cigna is doing is just creating more work for these people to keep fighting back, which is great, but it's going to keep continuing. This yep. Pushback. And, pushback. And, and I think with some of that, that might be, they're just kind of testing. They'll throw it out there and see how much resistance they get until they hit a point where they think the resistance isn't as great. Then it'll push through. So every time, anytime you see these kind of things come up, make sure yeah. you push back, take the time, yes. call your society, take, see what they're yes. doing, you know, yep. send notifications back to them, uh, send That's letters right. uh, for if you have physician groups or uh, you're in a, a healthcare system, you know, have mm-hmm. a letter mm-hmm. written or put together because, mm-hmm. you know, if they don't hear anything, they're going to go ahead and go right through with it. So it's only when right. we show that, no, you know, we're going to push back on these things that they're like, oh, okay, okay, we'll back off. So that's right. kind of where my mind goes with that is that they're just kind of throwing it out. there, seeing, testing that water to see how much resistance they're going to get. So keep up the good fight with that stuff when you that's see right. it y'all. That's right. Um, so um, any final words before we... Uh, before we close for today, actually now we're a couple minutes over. So, but do you have any final piece of advice? Well, we just have to continue, um, providing education after our audits. I think year after year, we have to get together with our clients and develop some sort of a schedule for auditing this, that, or the other for their practice. And then come on back with our report and then continued education. Um, I don't think this is a field that's going to end. I think it's only going to grow as healthcare continues to change and develop um, in the next few years as well, right? Especially with all of the new things and the new innovations and all of that that's happening in healthcare, that's not going to stop. So um, I think all of the work that we do is going to continue on and on. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Job security for us. That's what you got to think, right, (laughs) y'all? Yes, I think so. I think so. All right. And um, I just want to, before I uh, do the close to it, someone, uh, again, it's a LinkedIn user. So um, somebody had put a question in there about us doing a defined audit process. So uh, we will answer you offline on that. Thank you for the the question out there on that. I just didn't want you to think whoever you are. I didn't want you to think that that, uh, we kind of ignored that it was out there. So um, thanks y'all for watching and please go check out advanced coding services. So you can take a look at that retreat that Sonal and I will be present at in two weeks. So um, for those of y'all that are going, um, because we were getting updates on people that are signing up, um, we will see y'all in San Francisco or San Diego. And um, my broadcast then is falls on the day that I get in into San Diego on June 8th. So um, uh, I'm trying to, we're trying to put some different things together, Sonal and I, and some of the other speakers where maybe we can do a little um, broadcast with, with a lot of the speakers that are going to be in there live, just do some kind of like Q and a thing or something. So just kind of watch for that, but um, uh, we'll have something up for when we get out to San Diego, but Go check out Beth uh, Schlieper at advancedcodingservices.com and check out the retreat and uh, hope that y'all can make it to go see us. Um, It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, But until next time, thanks for joining us for our healthcare happenings where you come in to find out what's happening in healthcare. And we will uh, see y'all next time. Bye. Bye. 
And finally, I focus season nine spark on success. I want this ninth season spark to be filled with our world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for success in all we strive to do. So in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from Roy T. Bennett. Success is not how high you've climbed, but how you make a positive difference to the world. Absolutely true, right? I think this is an amazing quote that reminds us that there are many ways to look at what success means. It's our positivity that takes hold in times of strife. It's our encouragement of others, the mentoring of others, that leads towards mutual success. Not just ours, but theirs as well. I think this quote inspires us to look at success differently in each stage of our career, in each stage of our life. This quote inspires us to keep climbing the ladder of success and aim to make a positive impact along the way. I'm happy Roy T. Bennett's spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Now, all right, you guys, it's the beginning of June, right? Finally, some warmer temperatures, and I'm going to be flying out to San Diego California tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to some beautiful ocean views as well, right? The great big Pacific Ocean. I just can't wait. And meeting so many of my friends and colleagues and just networking, right? And teaching. There's so much to learn in this industry. So I'm very much looking forward to going. Cannot wait. Now, all right, you guys, just remember, please, Take the time out of each and every day for yourselves, right? Value yourself. You are important and your mental health is definitely important as well. So take some time out each and every day to just breathe, quiet the mind and de-stress. Just let me know how you guys unwind. Okay. I love those emails that are coming into me on my paint the medical picture podcast at gmail.com. So just continue sending me all those great emails. And we can talk about how you guys are clearing your heads and just breathing. All right, you guys, I wish you all an amazing week ahead. Thank you guys so much for listening in on today's very special episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.